Oh, hi, Soap. Oh, hey, Scotty. How are you? Good to see you, Baba. Are we starting uh, now? Because I'm still, I'm in a, in a okay. cocktail hour. All right. All right. Just chew, okay. swallow, stop. I just want to tell everybody that welcome to the Fair Media Council's Foley Awards, honoring the best of news and social media. Wait a minute. I saw, I thought we started 1115. I'm still in the cocktail no, hour. No, what, the co there's no cocktail hour. We're virtual. Are we're you virtual. Are you sure we're on now? <laughs> we are on right now. Oh, all right, but all right. I got to say, as you're eating your sushi, I am missing the Chateau Briand. Oh, Suk, you know what? What an honor for us to be hosting these awards today. And I do miss, right? We used to go in person. You'd, mm -hmm. you'd mingle with all the colleagues from the broadcasting and journalistic side and now social media. Uh, and, and here we are because of everything we've gone through in the last year and, and just the great way that, that the broadcasting industry just really just, you know, we adapted to the, to, to the whole COVID-19 pandemic and it gave us an opportunity for me to put in a brick wall back here <laughs> and order some posters. And it was just, it's been phenomenal with technology to the way everything worked out now. Yeah, and we're virtual today, and we continue to recreate like so many other journalists have, and that's why we are honoring the best in news and social media. So, okay, so we want to tell everybody a couple of business things. Go There's ahead. a chat box throughout the event, so you get to talk to us. You get to congratulate the winners. There's also, you could do this, grab a, green, uh, a screenshot and share it on social media. Here's the hashtag you got to use, okay? Hashtag it with FMC Folio. Folio, Hashtag okay? FMC Folio. Soup, the other thing all of this technology has allowed us to do when we're broadcasting, um, it's allowed guys like me to, to put on just suit tops and, and nothing underneath. And it's just been, it's just so freeing. <laughs> Uh, to be on TV that way. And I'm just, I'm very not that you excited. haven't been free before, Scott, free to say what you want, free to do what you want. Listen, again, it, we want to thank Jackie Clement for bringing us on today. Um, I know, uh, I guess all of the other broadcast professionals in the market weren't available. Uh, so you and I are here. Um, I am missing Ernie and Astis at this yeah, point. Where's Ernie? Usually, where is Ernie? Ernie always had jokes for us. Uh, no, a good hug. A little hug, right? He'd always have a joke for you. Um, but Suk, you know what? Listen, in all honesty, one of the bright spots for us, if you want to call it a bright spot in this pandemic, uh, was the advent of the Suki and Scott show, which we, you know, we, we started a year ago, sure. uh, which really is kind of a hobby to give people something to kind of, you know, escape from all the really bad news out there. Uh, and it just snowballed into this, this tonight show type of show. We can't even stop if we wanted to. Yep, the train is moving and it's moving fast. And we've created these uh, this show and put it on an OTT platform, which can be seen nationwide. So, yeah, it was a little show that started during the pandemic uh, to give people a little bright spot, a little laughter, a little camaraderie and a community. But now the community has grown and and we grow with it. So the technology is part of what we are doing today. And that's why the Fair Media Council is ready to announce a record number of winners. Mm -hmm. And guess what? We have some of our friends here. We've got WCBS News Radio's 880s, Linda Lopez. And of course, wow. we've worked with Linda. Love we love Linda. Linda. love Linda. And Fox 5's Dairy Alexander. Uh, we love Dairy too. Uh, and we miss them. I wish we could, I guess we're giving them a virtual hug right now, a virtual Duke, hug. You, you know, we, you and I have worked with both of those very talented women. I was, I go back to, to UPN nine days with Linda Lopez. And I, <laughs> I was I was I was disappointed when she and A Rod broke up, and I'm just you know I'm I'm trying to get over that, and I, I, uh, I she's moving on as well. Uh, Scotty, I don't know what you're talking about. Uh, Linda, no, 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 it's her sister. Just stop. And why are we talking about that? Suki, stop. Linda Lopez <laughs> and A Rod. Was it, no, no. Was it Jeter? No. Aaron Judge. No. Are you Can sure? Move on. Linda. Linda wants me to move on. John Carlos Stanton. <laughs> Uh, no, can we move on? Go ahead, go ahead. Let's girl start. code, you're you're killing girl code right here. Okay, <laughs> all right. Listen, we've got a record number of judges to thank. We're going to introduce them later on in the program. As uh, for the first time, we've got junior judges, students yes. from fourth grade through college, learning how to pull new stories apart and take a look. Uh, they're also taking a giant step forward and really understanding how it is to navigate. Of course, the media landscape that we navigate every day today. Yes, yeah, Suk, and the Fair Media Council mission is to advocate for quality news and work to create a media savvy society. The goal is to keep our communities vibrant, our businesses competitive, and our democracy strong. 
And the key is quality news and information that's trustworthy and relevant to your life. FMC's work is unlike any organization in the country, folks, and it's a nonprofit organization. Uh, listen, we'd love you to join and get involved, and we want you to get media savvy. All right, today's program is dedicated to two longtime and dedicated members of the Fair Media Council Board, uh, the Board of Directors, that is, James Kinney and Terry Lynham. Thanks for everything now. And we really want to say, go and enjoy your grandchildren. But we also want to tell everybody what they did that was so special, Scott. Yeah, so let me, uh, let me just give you a little uh, information on those guys. Here's what they did. Uh, with the help from all of you, too, um, 1979, the predecessor to FMC was created, focusing on local television news. Cable and the Internet well, it wasn't even born yet. Uh, it was known as the Long Island Coalition for Fair Broadcasting Incorporated. Uh, it monitored the amount of time over the air news uh, in New York based television stations devoted to Long Island specific news. Um, and Jim and Terry were uh, toddlers back then, or so they want you to believe. <laughs> In 2004, the Fair Media Council was introduced with an expanded two-sided mission to advocate for quality forms of all news media and to create a media-savvy society. FMC's mission was created to reflect technology's continuous and evolving impact on media and society. The result, an organization unlike any in the country, and boy, oh boy, Jim and Terry surely were busy, Sue. I'm laughing at your jokes. I just wanted to tell you that. Oh, you've got uh, one more uh, slide. <laughs> you still on a rod? No, uh, no, move, move 2015 on. 2015 <laughs> FMC programming expanded to include um, hyper local, regional, and national news and issues uh, because ultimately all stories were connected. Our point of view begins from our home on Long Island and expands from there. Uh, Jim and Terry like that. They like that a lot. They really did. Uh, and then, uh, let's see, 2015 happened in 2020 due to COVID-19 restrictions on public gatherings. FMC creates new virtual programming and reshapes signature events to continue its work. In the process, the FMC brand attracts a national audience. Uh, Jim and Terry, you were supposed to take a bow right there. So there hmm. you go, Sue. <laughs> Jim and Terry, <laughs> little congratulations, Terry Lynham and James Kinney. Uh, from Rabbit Ears and 8-Track Tapes. Thanks for helping us evolve into something special. And Sue, like you mentioned, use the chat box. If you guys want to thank Jim and Terry for all their help and support over the years, um, we want you to share a memory or something to make them smile. Uh, and maybe, just maybe, uh, we'll get those guys uh, to respond a little bit. All right. So let's give out a shout out to all of our sponsors because without our sponsors, none of this would be really be possible. We've got... Uh, Beth Page Federal Credit Union, and we're looking at Mount Sinai, South Nassau. So we want to say thank you to them. Northwell Health. We've got <laughs> Northwell Health right there. <laughs> Northwell Health, and uh, we're moving on. And then once again, Mount Sinai, South Nassau. So thank you, Mount Sinai, St. Joseph's College as well, and Hofstra University. Um, there are so many supporters. They include Edgewise Energy and Robert B. Cattell. Our media sponsors are WSHU Public Radio, WNET, WLIW Long Island Business News, and of course, the Suki and Scott Show. The well, Suki and Scott Show every Tuesday through Thursday on Facebook Live at 7.30. <laughs> all right, listen, uh, <laughs> let's talk about what the Folio Awards is all about. Yeah. Why this matters, Souk. Um, the Folio Awards is the program that improves the news, so we all win, right? And yeah. the judging process teaches judges how to critique news and social media today. They can use the tools and techniques to navigate today's complicated media landscape with a lot of confidence. All right, but before we do that, before we get to go behind the scenes and the headlines of Newsday's investigative report that will prove to be a favorite story of the Foley Awards mm -hmm. judges. Uh, for this next portion of the show, we have to welcome Fair Media Council CEO and Executive Director, Jackie Clement. Jackie! <laughs> Here I am. Hey, Jackie. Hi, Jack. How are oh. you? Thank you. Thank you so much for that introduction. I don't know what to do with myself now. 
I'm busy. I know I need uh, food and drink orders from you too before we're done. Don't worry oh, about don't that. Don't worry. I'm sure there's something else in his cup of tea and after that sushi <laughs> too. I have no doubt. So I want to um, turn the program uh, over to our next phase, which is a behind the headlines chat with three reporters from Newsday. Well, two reporters and a multimedia producer, as we've mentioned a couple of times how important technology is today. Um, and I want to bring these guys on. So I want to introduce to you Paul LaRocco. He's a reporter on the Newsday Investigative Desk, as well as David Schwartz, also a reporter working closely with Paul. And Jeff Basinger, who is the senior multimedia producer at Newsday. And this is interesting because, you know, you think of Newsday as a newspaper, but they are doing a lot of multimedia work these days. So if we can get these guys to turn on their audio and video. There's Jeff. Hi, Jeff. Hey, thanks for having us. Yeah, oh, happy to. How are you doing today? Doing good. Good. All right. Where did Paul and David go? Are they being shy? Oh, there they are. No. I'm curious. <laughs> Hi, Jackie. <laughs> Hi there. Thank you so much for joining us. First of all, I really didn't expect to get all three of you. So we're thrilled to be able to have the whole team with us. Um, to everyone who's watching, I want to point out that we want to have a chat with these gentlemen, but we also want you to be part of the chat. So don't think twice about if you have a question, use the Q&A box down below. As all of our programming, we want to have you drive the conversation with your questions. So if you think of anything as we chat, whether it's related or not, feel free to ask the question. And we do have a lot of student journalists with us today. Now's a great opportunity to ask some questions. So don't be shy and take advantage of it. Um, so I think, Paul, let me start with you um, because we, we do have people from throughout the metro area. So if you could just quickly sum up what the Grumman Plume story was about. Sure. Um, and again, thanks for having us. Um, this was a story that for anyone who lives in the region, um, you know, it really Nassau County, but specifically Bethpage and the surrounding communities, uh, you know, likely knew it pretty well because it had been, you know, pretty out there in the news for, you know, several, you know, probably more than a decade for sure, because there's so much good coverage from our previous colleagues at Newsday, other media, Long Island Press, Business News, to, everyone has done great coverage over the years on the plume, and it was known to be, you know, basically an environmental crisis, one of the worst environmental, uh, you know, crises on Long Island, uh, because of the uh, groundwater um, being contaminated, you know, uh, um, you know, under the former um, Grumman, North of Grumman um, Navy um, um, facility in Bethpage. Mm -hmm. And, you know, really, um, essentially from the 90s on, you know, it was, it was well known that this was, this groundwater contamination was spreading, um, you know, and that uh, state officials and, uh, you know, other regulators hadn't really done a ton to, to really stop and, and contain it. So that that's kind of, you know, the, the, the overarching view of, um, you know, of the issue when, when we went into it. Okay, let me let me show you what it what happened that got the three of you invited to join us today. Um, Jenna, can we go to that slide, please? This, this has not happened before where we have had one story take home five awards. So the Grumman Plume Decades of Deceit, you've won the Robert W. Green Award for investigative reporting, the Best News Special Report, the Community Service Award, the Environment News uh, Reporting Award, and the Best Multimedia Package Award from the Folio uh, Awards judges. So first up, congratulations. And not only for all these wins, but for making history with us because no one has swept categories like this before. Um, but the other thing I wanna do is explain to you about our judging because we have, we always have journalists in the mix, but then we also have what I like to call real people, which is your audience, okay? Um, so our mix of judges are, are journalists, former journalists, as well as the people who would be in your audience. And, you know, an emphasis on our judging is the news needs to be relevant. It needs to be authentic. People who are reading it or watching it, they need to know that it's true and they can relate to it. So I want to share with you some of our judges' um, reactions to your story. And these guys haven't seen this before, so this is new to them. So Judge Stephanie Bronto, well-written, extensively documented, traced both the history and the effects. 
excellent investigative reporting. Judge Catherine Leibel, the piece on the plume is phenomenal on multiple levels. Grateful to see Newsday getting into such depth with this. Judge Samuel Chu, I'm grateful that this story is helping Long Islanders fight for corporate accountability. And we'll talk more about that. Judge Christopher Wright, my favorite story was the plume story. I'm about a mile or two from the point of the plume's emanation which is as local as local news gets, right? And Judge Ginny Greenberg, a terrific job of, of explaining the history of the contamination and what it means to the physical and economic health of <clears throat> residents. The article also does a great job of conveying, go back, wait, I can't read that fast. <laughs> there you go. The article and, and the work does a great job of conveying the sense of betrayal that community leaders and residents continue to suffer which is a really important point from Ginny Greenberg. And one of our junior judges, Griffin, my favorite news story by far is Newsday's Grum and Plume, best investigative journalism on a topic that is very pressing to the local community and best production values too. The spectacular visuals just kept coming. So that's some nice high praise from people that you normally wouldn't get to meet. Sure. <laughs> So let's talk about, though, yeah, because, Paul, as you had mentioned, this isn't actually a new story. People have known about it for, for years. And, you know, if you're on Long Island for any amount of time, you would have heard about it. So what was it that made you do the story now? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, we had, um, like I said, we had, we had there had been so much good coverage out there of everything that had gone on in the last 10, 15 years. And, you know, so we, there wasn't going to be much new ground. We probably were going to be able to break within things that happened once this became a very prominent issue in the minds of many. And that's due to the great work that everyone has done in the last 10, 15 years. So we, we kind of went into it looking, okay, if we could kind of tell a complete history of this um, issue, um, you know, what will we find? And, and we decided that, you know, you pretty much had to go back to the beginning uh, when Grumman, you know, obviously post-World War II uh, really became huge, such ingrained in the community and Bethpage and so beloved over, over many decades for their work in the community and what they meant, to, you know, in terms of uh, jobs and, 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 you know, employment on Long Island. But so we, we, we decided that, you know, going back, you know, in a really in-depth way and trying to figure out what they knew, kind of when they knew it, how they were presenting information at the time and how all the officials and regulators were, were reacting to that information. And, you know, could we find, um, you know, um, things that showed that maybe things, you know, something could have been done earlier, if not to stop this, but to certainly lessen its impact, you know, in the, in the, right now. So there was there was no actual incident or event that made you say let's do this now. I mean, I think well, I I think the um, you know, um, and Dave could add to this. Uh, at the time we got into this, the state, you know, because of the the increased coverage in recent years and pressure from the community, had finally uh, just within the recent months, right as we started working on this, had come up with a very aggressive, expansive, expensive plan to try to finally contain the contamination that had you know been spreading and 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 not and not having been contained over many years of uh, residents calling for such action. So that, that did provide a kind of a good angle or, or a way to get into it. David? Yeah, yeah and it was an open question at that point of um, how would the responsible parties, which is the term for the people who were responsible for the pollution in the ground, uh, Northrop Grumman and the Navy, what kind of cleanup would they agree to? And would this be a protracted legal battle? And so we wanted to um, dig into it. And Newsday wanted to dig into this whole issue. And, and then, you know, I, I'm going to credit my modest colleague, Paul here, you know, he was looking through old court records, and we were meeting with community leaders and longtime participants. And Paul was looking at um, an old court case and found some documents that were supposed to be sealed. They were uh, improperly filed. And that really, uh, provided some revelations about what the company knew and as Paul said, when they knew it, you know? Yeah, okay. Paul, what did you do when you came across the documents? 
Yeah, I mean, that, that's kind of like the, the wow moment in all this, because, you know, we had been putting together, you know, a very detailed history of, um, you know, public statements they had made, um, you know, things that were out there in the public record. And, the, you know, the kind of missing piece, obviously, was, you know, what were, what, what did they know or, or say behind the scenes and what information, you know, had not reached the public at critical moments. So, you know, we, we go through and, you know, reporters go through um, lawsuits, dockets, documents all the time. And sometimes you do it just to do it because you know you don't think much is going to be out there you know you see the things that are supposed to be filed and you know a lot of things that you know in civil litigation is confidential and you know I was coming across a lot of dockets that said filed under seal confidential and you know I decided to click on one and one set of exhibits had the header page saying you know filed under seal um, and then they were not under seal they, they were they were there so you know we quickly downloaded them and and kind of just started going through them and tried to match them with the things that, you know, were publicly known at the time. And it really was stark and, and it kind of did create the kind of framework for the story. You downloaded quickly, hoping no one would notice. Because <laughs> <Exactly. laughs> you never know with these things, if, you know, you know, how long it had been out there, you know, if people even knew it was available. So you, you just kind of have to pounce. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so from start to finish, how long did the project take? Um, you know, I, I'd say, you know, we were, we had started our initial research probably about a year before, it, you know, it was, it was published in terms of, you know, doing initial interviews, just kind of getting our, you know, really make sure we understood the issue. But, you know, I would say a good nine months of intensive, you know, pretty close to full time um, work on this. And what took up most of the time? Really, it was it was the um, you know the the editing and the fact checking you know and I have to give credit to our, our former editor you know our editor on the project Marty Gottlieb he was just so meticulous and always challenging us to um, you know uh, go back into documents we'd already gone into you know look for things and and really try to um, organize the the stories um, you know in a way that could have the most impact you know Dave and I first thought oh maybe this is two stories and and Marty saw it as a as kind of a big series and a you know chronology of, of the history of deceit and um, you know that that kind of really helped uh, um, you know uh, I guess you know have the impact it did yeah. so did he did he come up with the headline decades of deceit was that Marty um, I, 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 I believe effort. go ahead Dave <laughs> I, I think it was a team effort um, okay all right Bob Shields and Doug uh, Dutton, know, right yeah. Doug Dutton yeah um, you know, there, it, and it really does take a whole team. Like, it's not just Jeff, Paul, and I working on it. Like, there, there is a ton of digital people and the people working on the print presentation and all of that. And, and one thing that took a lot of time was we foiled um, and FOIAed, you know, we put freedom of information requests in with the state, uh, federal governments, and got thousands of documents. Um, that we read through. And what Marty told us at the beginning was become so immersed and become such, become so immersed in this that you will discover things that even the experts and people who've been working on this for, you know, their entire careers haven't known. And that's such a daunting, uh, you know, task to be given at the beginning. Mm -hmm. But, you know, it turns out we, we found new things and things that you know, even sources that, you know, in the state and water district, um, things that they hadn't known or had forgotten or, you know, had been buried. Yeah. Well, what you're describing is a very different scenario than what we're used to hearing about news media today, which is we don't have time to do anything. We don't have any resources. You know, this kind of is the exact opposite where you were given latitude to, to really delve into something. So do you, do you think it was worth the time and effort you invested. Oh, for sure. And, and you know, uh, it's a credit to Newsday for still devoting resources to, uh, you know, investigative journalism and reporters that could really work full time on a project and not be broken off, you know, for the most part for uh, daily or, or weekly stories. Um, so, you know, that, in a way, it's the only way you're going to produce, um, you know, uh, 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 stories and projects that, that you know, can have, uh, you know, an impact, you know, like this. And we're, we're thankful for that. And, it, it, you know, you, you do need the time, you know. Know, and, and that's, I guess that's happening less and less, but we are appreciative of, of you know, news providing those resources. We're extremely fortunate to be able to 
put time in and, and a project like this wouldn't be what it is without that time. It, it's, it's just, it, it, it would have, um, it would have suffered if we were like rushed or forced to um, work on other projects at the same time. So um, yeah, we're very lucky. <laughs> now, and, yeah. and I'm sorry, towards the end of it though, like the, in December of last year, um, the state came out with this big plan for that would finally stop the spread of it and like eventually lead to the, you know, large cleanup, large scale cleanup. And towards the end of last year, um, Northrop Grumman and the Navy agreed to, to that, which was a major step and prevents years of um, foot dragging or legal fights and, and stuff like that. So, you know, the thought that our series, you know, contributed to that or helped raise awareness about this issue, as some people have said, you know, was pretty meaningful to us. Okay. Yeah, definitely. That's the impact. Let's step back to right before it goes live. Hmm. What, what are you feeling? What are you thinking? Paul, <laughs> after spending 10 months working on a story like that, how much in advance notice did you have that it would be published on such and such a day? I mean, we knew we were, um, you know, leading up to things because, you know, uh, um, you know, the work, you know, is always, you know, it, it's always thorough and it's always, you know, um, uh, um, you know, in intense. But it gets even more intense, you know, in the, in the last, you know, weeks and, and days. And um, you know, you you kind of obviously, you know. You get a little, you know, obviously like almost like a before butterflies in your stomach right before something's going to post online because you don't know the reaction. You want to make sure, you know, we, we fact check things a hundred times, but you just you just want to be as diligent as possible. Did I miss anything? Did, did, did something, you know, some, you know, something get through? So, um, you know, there, there's a lot of nerves there. And uh, but but, you know, I really need to say that, you know, in the in the final weeks and, and uh, days, you know, just Jeff's work was just unbelievable and getting there. I know you're probably going to get to the presentation. But when you talked about the last days, you know, I think a lot of the work was on that side in, in, the, in the last days and, and really the way it looked in the end, you know, it didn't look that way, you know, week, two weeks, you know, before it was uh, published, it, it, you know, a lot of that came together, you know, at the, at, you know, in the final days. Yeah, there, there must be some, I, I guess, um, kind of a trepidation when you're dealing with, with a company as large as Northrop Grumman. Hmm. And I'm, I'm wondering, you know, once it was published, did you kind of run outside to see if there was anything incoming <laughs> at you? <laughs> Yeah, I mean, you know, it, that's true because, you know, as a reporter, no matter who you're, you know, um, writing about, uh, whether it's, you know, a regular person or a giant multinational, uh, you know, corporation, you want to make sure you get the details right. But, you know, uh, I, you know, and that that should be the case all the time. But it's true that, you know, when when a, an entity has the resources they do and, and the reach they do, uh, you know, um, you you obviously, you know, it's a little heightened because, you know, you know, they have the resources to, to you know, if you got something wrong to publicly challenge you if, if it if it made them look a certain way to to really push back hard and and you know so that that really makes you work harder to uh to you know to nail everything down but even that said you know you still get that feeling you know of, of almost dread before something comes out as you know as, as a reporter and and just making sure that uh, you know that that everything did come together the way you wanted it to. especially on a on with such a historically beloved company as well especially on long island um so ingrained and in, in mm -hmm. building up Long Island as a workforce and stuff so um yeah there's definitely a little nervousness uh, but um but the response was really incredible yeah that that is also one of the very interesting things too because Grumman is simply beloved by Long Islanders you never hear a negative story coming out of people who worked for Grumman and you can't, you trip over people. Everyone has either worked for Grumman or someone in their family worked for Grumman or they met their spouse at Grumman. So for people to have such high praise about a company for how it treated its people, how do you reconcile how that same company treated the environment? It's almost like two separate stories happening. So was, was there pushback from people when you were out doing interviews saying, no, 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 you can't talk about Grumman like this? We definitely found um, a lot of loyalty to Grumman, and we tried to talk to former employees, and we'd run into that. And even people of Bethpage, they they talked about how 
they work there or their families work there. And that's one of the things that they were trying to reconcile is, you know, this company that we love that helped land the man on the moon, why, why could they do that and not also clean up the pollution, you know, and the legacy, you know, that, that has become part of their legacy. So, you know, so, you know, we were trying to, in a sensitive way and fair way, like explain that kind of dual role that has emerged in the company, you know, decades later and how the community holds that in their head and how, um, you know, and representing it there. Yeah. So what was Gremmon's response after the story went live? Um, they actually never directly responded to us. Um, <clears throat> you know, they... Um, as we had follow-ups um, about, uh, you know, the, the 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 cleanup and the reaction, you know, they they'd issue, you know, kind of their very, you know, disciplined, you know, similar statements about their commitment to the cleanup and working with all the stakeholders and in, in doing it, and and you know, I guess you know that that was almost very similar to the statements that they had put out before. So you know, we took it as as a good thing that you know if they had something, you know, if there was a glaring error, something really wrong, something egregious. You know, they would have let us know about it, and you or know, a minor they, error. Yeah. <laughs> so, so yeah, they 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 took the, their statements right after as we wrote follow up stories were very similar to the statements they had issued for years, and really up until they agreed to, with the state, um, you know, at the very um, you know end of last year to um, you know sign on to the the very large plan they had mostly resisted for for many years, and to pay you know, significant amount of damages that they also hadn't, you know, previously offered to pay. So Jeff, tell me from your perspective to, to create visuals out of this story, what was the challenge for you? Uh, a lot, there were a lot of challenges. Um, I mean, when I first started peripherally getting involved in the story, when they were beginning the reporting, um, the first challenge is just understanding what they're doing. And, and luckily, I, these two reporters are amazing and so easy to work with. So um, once you sort of understand it, you start realizing that most of the story happens underground, which makes it really difficult to do visually. Um, and then there's a lot of documents, uh, a lot a lot of documents. And how do you make documents interesting visually? Um, but working with the web team, working with them, uh, you know, we have a lot of great minds coming together to collaborate to um, to sort of figure out the best plan, like figure out the best voices to put in the documentary, figure out um, what the actual story should be visually. Um, and in this case, a big part of the story uh, is the investigation itself, is, the, is, is Paul and David's um, experience going through and finding these, these uh, supposed to be sealed documents. So you make sure that that's part of like the documentary, you make sure that's part of the overall narrative story. Um, and then, yeah, and then at the, at the end of the day, just um, bringing attention to the important visuals of uh, the people that we interviewed, um, the, you know, the, the trying to animate what the spread looks like, which some people, uh, you know, I think you showed briefly before mm -hmm. the uh, actual um, spread over the years, you know, to really communicate um, what they discovered. Yeah, I've watched the spread quite a few times now. Uh, it is very mesmerizing, it is. But, it all, but it also kind of reminded me of the 1958 cinema classic, The Blob, where, <laughs> where it just keeps well, spreading. Well, that's kind of what it is. It's an <laughs> underground blob. So. <laughs> so it's a shame you couldn't go underground, though, I know. to be able to capture something. If I had the technology to, to film in, in dirt, uh, I would have. <laughs> <laughs> so how long did it take you to do your portion of the project? Well, like I said, I was peripherally involved at the beginning, um, but it's really ramped up towards the end when we were um, uh, trying to get it ready for for publication. Um, getting the you know what's the front image going to be, which ended up being the blob. Um, <laughs> but uh, yeah, it's, um, uh, it, it was it was pretty much nonstop for the last month. I'd I think Paul and David, if I'm not mistaken, for me it was that's all I did for a month was just work on visualizing their story, um, had them give me a tour of the ballpark that was severely affected by the by the um, toxic um, uh, waste and stuff. So um, yeah, it's about a month of just nonstop work on this. So yeah. is there any element while you were doing this story that 
really surprised you? Um, yeah, yeah. I mean, I surprised, I would say the, the families that we talked to, um, who had the really personal story that lived there that felt like, you know, they, they all had a type of cancer or mm -hmm. had experienced or lost loved ones and, and those human element stories that mm -hmm. I, I maybe not surprised, but it, it impacted me, um, which was why we felt it was necessary to put in the story as well. And Paul can talk about the Paul and David can talk about them. Yeah, I mean, I just want to add since since you brought that up that you know the, I think the 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 project worked the way it did because it wasn't just about the you know the deception and the history and what they knew and when they when they knew it you know that was one part but it, I don't think it would have worked without a you know a, a, the other part which was the impact it had on the people and the community and you know Dave the, he's modest too he deserves so much credit just for the the sensitivity and and the the way he was able to to report some of those really sticky issues with you know health effects and and you know um, you know people's concerns versus science and and you know giving both the, you know fair weight and and I thought that was just you know that really made the, the whole thing. David anything to add on this point? No I mean that, that was just one of the challenges was um, you know, explaining there is this pervasive fear and you hear through many parts of Long Island about what's in the water and pollution. And then, but you look at, at the science and it, it turns out it is just incredibly difficult to prove that cancers can be directly traced back to any particular pollution. And it's just extremely difficult and just spending time talking to experts and balancing that with the real psychological toll it's taken and the real fear and just because it can't be proven doesn't mean it's um not there but you know walking that line between not trying to you know scare people uh, and create panic and then not dismissing what could be real real concerns about this so okay so so what's next now with this project is it done are you are you still getting responses to your FOIL requests? What's going on? Uh, yes, we have a few more thousand pages to uh, <laughs> go through. I, just like a few weeks ago, I got another FOIL back from the EPA about correspondence that they've had with the Navy and the state and Northrop Grumman. Um, so I mean that that's to our long to do list. Um, you know, right now we're we're still monitoring what's happening with the state and the state plan, Paul. <clears throat> yeah, I mean, you know, in, in a way this, you know, while this project is done, you know, the work on this issue will, will never end, you know, whether it's for us or people in the future, you know, it'll be, <clears throat> you know, following how the, um, how the state and, and the Grumman and the Navy follow up on, on you know, their promises now to, to finally clean this up, you know, how the uh, community uh, continues to, um, you know, uh, uh, track this and be affected by it. You know, there are actually class action lawsuits out there, um, you know, uh, alleging, you know, the health effects, uh, you know, and then and the illnesses that people had in the community were, you know, uh, the allegation is that they were tied to the, um, not only the, um, you know, the groundwater pollution, but, you know, the soil vapor pollution and even potentially mm -hmm. air pollution you know, uh, from that area. So, you know, there's, um, there's still a lot of serious things to, to, you know, track and, you know, Newsday hopefully will continue to do so. And how will that work? Is this now your baby? Anything to do with this? Or, or do you kind of divvy it up and say, let somebody else go cover that part of it? <laughs> It, it, I mean, it's hard, you know, it, it's, well, we obviously are invested in it and we still have people call us and, and tell us what's going on. And, 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 you know, obviously we, we have other projects too, that we're working on and have been asked to work on that, that aren't involved in this, but I think we'll always have some kind of investment in it and whether or not, you know, you know, we can get to every story, you know, we hope that, you know, Newsday, you know, it, obviously we'll, we'll, we'll still be able to cover this and, and hopefully we'll have a role as well. Yeah, Paul and I... Yeah, I mean, during COVID, um, the whole team was focused on the pandemic for a while. Uh, mm -hmm. And and we've been doing things about criminal justice system and, uh, you know, so okay. there are a lot of topics to cover. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, there's no shortage of news this past year, right? Um, so let's kind of segue into the advice portion, I'll call it as we do have a lot of students, but we also have people who are trying to understand 
you know, how you put these stories together and what do you need to know to put a story like this together? So what would you say was the most important skill that you needed to be able to pull together something like this? Um, I mean, I, I think it's just uh, not assuming you know everything going in. I know that sounds really obvious, but you know, just uh, th this was an issue that had been out there again and had been really covered really well. But you know, still, even for something like that, you know, you 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 really dig into it and, and take the time and just set, you know set aside any assumptions you have about you know the 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 issue, and, and you're going to find a lot out. So I think you just have to go into any story with a really you know an open mind and 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 you know just. You know, obviously, resources are always an issue, but but you know, do the most research you possibly can within reason on, on, a, on a topic to uh, you know feel like you, you can you can um, you know tell it in a you know, authoritative you know fair and accurate way. Okay, Dave. Um, I, I guess perseverance, like, and I, I just have been finding that you know just not giving up and like you know these life is a marathon and these stories are marathons and, you know, just, just being able to keep forging ahead and not burning out and just keep chipping away at these things okay. because, because it is like that. I mean, you, you do have those occasional moments of aha, you know, getting a great thing and that keeps you going. But like most days you're, you're just kind of grinding away, I think. Okay. Jeff, you wanna add anything to that? But I'm also going to ask you if you have any advice for the students that are watching. Uh, I would say advice for the students is, is learn from Paul here. Uh, if you see secret documents, download them immediately. <laughs> that is like the best, <laughs> the best advice I could give. And visually, I would say um, just uh, when, you're, when you're working with a team, uh, like trying to visualize what somebody else is reporting or your own story is really just plot out everything you have, like look at everything from sort of a bird's eye view, every, every detail, every angle, every possible visual. And once you find that, that package of everything and start picking out the things that tell the story the best, and uh, it ended up working out for us. All right, let me switch back, Dave. Any, any advice to the uh, student journalists who are paying attention to you right now? Um, you know, besides perseverance, just like, I, I think Paul's I, always keeping an open mind, be, be willing to challenge your own assumptions and, uh, you know, pick apart kind of your preconceptions that you've walked into things and always, you know, be open to how something that you assume is right is not right. Yeah. Okay. All right, Paul, anything to wrap up with? Um, I mean, just just to go back to just one more little bit of advice that's not completely related is just that, you know, um, just just if, if you're interested in getting into the business, you know, um, it, it may not be the sexiest, but, you know, local news is just so important. And, you know, covering local issues like this, you know, as, as resources, you know, in, in pretty much in all parts of the country, you know, uh, uh, lessen to some degree for on the ground local reporting, you know, I mean, the, it, it may, it's, it's very attractive to want to go into, uh, you know, a place where you could immediately be at the biggest stories, you know, whether, you know, whether it's in uh, Washington or, or anywhere else, but, you know, I mean, people still need to go, still need to know what's going on, you know, in their communities in a very in-depth way, you know, and places that have the resources to devote, you know, to local issues, um, uh, you know, on, um, you know, in an invest, use investigative resources like that, you know, I think is, is you know, should be, people should, you know, strive to, to try to find those places. <laughs> All right, I, I do have a question from the audience here, which is, do you have any last words for the neighbors or residents that are living through this? Um, you know, we're gonna continue watching and Newsday is gonna continue watching what happens with the cleanup uh, and make sure that, um, you know, one of, there have always been delays and promises made and then timelines get pushed back. And so that's one of the things to watch for. Uh, and, you know, the water district has watched for it and, you know, just staying on top of it to make sure that the promises that are, have been made are kept, you know, and, and that's one of the things that we've found is, you know, so to be aware of. 
All right. Well, we thank you very much for your work and all of the efforts throughout the past 10 months, which I know were not glamorous for most of them, um, but the impact of the story, the way it was presented, it has been recognized. I, I hope that makes you feel good and kind of recharges your batteries for, for the next thing you tackle. And we do appreciate you spending this time with us. So we are already out of time. That went pretty fast, right? Um, congratulations to you folks to Newsday for, for doing this type of work. I'm gonna turn things back over to Scott and Suki. Just gonna do a quick congratulations to all the winners and to the judges and our sponsors for making all of this happen. Um, and thank you very much also to Linda and Derry who are doing the awards presentations. They get to have all the fun. So I sign off now, Scott and Suki, it's all you. All right, fantastic. I think you can hear me, right? Scott, you got me? Oh, Suk, how, how interesting was that? Very, we're just reminded of like Aaron Brockovich, that movie, right? With the, yeah. the big company in town. And it's just, I mean, my God, so much time spent and it's just investigative journalism is just, it's a, it's a phenomenal, phenomenal thing to be able to do. Yeah, you have to be real determined and persistent to keep that going. And, and, and real pearls of wisdom too. And, uh, and um, thank them for their hard work and their continued success at Newsday. Yeah. All right, Scott, let's talk about the Folio Awards. Let's move on and find out why Folio matters. Uh, yes, yeah, so the Folio Awards is the program that improves the news so we all win. And the judging process teaches judges how to critique news and social media today. They can use the tools and techniques to navigate today's complicated media and the media landscape with confidence. So you're probably asking what wins at the Folio Awards? You know, well, what wins at Folio pro provides crucial audience feedback to newsrooms and media creators. The feedback is also used in news decisions uh, that are made throughout the year. Suki, are you ready to meet the judges before <laughs> we give out some awards? Let's get ready to rumble. Let's do it. Let's go. <laughs> Let's take a look at some of the wonderful people that make all of this possible. All right, we've got Judge Osger Akun, who's a PhD. We've got Judge Ernst T. Bartol, Esquire. Judge Stephanie Branta. Judge Sean Caffrey Agoglia. Nice. And Judge Robert B. Cattell. <laughs> That's why I gave you that list. Yeah, thank uh, you. And then we, we have the next ones. Judge Melissa Conley, Jennifer Chu, Sammy Chu. Trudy Fitzsimmons and Jody Fisher. See the easy Our, things I get to do. Yeah, yeah, I love Jody. <laughs> Big shout out to Jody Fisher right there. We've got Judge Paul C. Ocasio, Judge Claire Fratello, Judge George Gorman Jr., Judge Anne Marie Gothard, Judge Ginny Greenberg. And then switching over, you got uh, Judge Michael Harrison coming up, Judge Catherine label, I believe, Judge Bruce Lambert, Judge Nancy Leghart, and Judge Jessica McClear Decatur. We've got Judge Neela Mukherjee Lochtel, nice. Judge Jason Moline, Judge Jeff Morozov, Judge Pauly T. Patcher, Judge Jeffrey L. Reynolds, PhD. And then we have Judge Jay Schoenfeld, Judge Dina Santarelli, Judge Carolyn Shore Levin, Judge David Streich, or Strike, hopefully I got that right, and Judge Charles Scott. Then finally, of all the other judges, we've got Judge Richard Torenzano, Judge Ibru Ulisoy, Judge Christopher Wright, and Judge Leela Zogby. Hey, and also, Scotty, on yep. to junior judges, the junior judges. Yes, yeah, Suki, junior judges this time around. College students, you got Judge Madeline Greenberg, Judge Ronald Label, or Libel, hopefully that's right, Judge Michael Porter, and Judge Griffin Ryan. And middle school and high school judges as well. We've got Judge Delilah, Judge Dylan, Judge Lizzie, Judge Jacob, Judge Julia and Judge Maxwell. I want to say congratulations yeah. to all the judges. That last group of judges, Suk, so famous, they go by one name, like Cher and Stan. <laughs> Love it. Or Suki. Or all right. Suki. Uh, today's event's also being recorded and will be available on YouTube and at Fair Media Council. 
org. Suk, you know what I love before we get to Linda at the beginning of the show and they were rolling in like our biographies at the beginning. I love yeah. how they throw Sopranos on for you. <laughs> what did you, do? Did, you Ag- to- <laughs> did you date Tony in one episode? Probably. No, 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 no. I love it. I was an actress. Thank you, Jackie. I love it. <laughs> um, anyway, let's go t- turn things over to our friend and WCBS News Radio 880 anchor, Linda Lopez. Linda, good to see you. Come on in, Linda. Scott and Suki. I love <laughs> so long. It's been a long time, but it's so great to see you. And congratulations. Listen to you all the time on the radio. And congratulations on the book. Oh, thank you so much, you guys. I really appreciate that. I miss doing this in person because, as you guys were saying before, it's the one time we all get to see each other. We we all. It's such a small business. We all know each other and love each other. And Getting missing out on that chance, you know, to do the cocktail hour with you and the sushi with you, Scott. I have to say, I'm looking at this year for sure. And no dessert, Linda. There's definitely no dessert. And no dessert, the part I stick around for. So, (laughs) but no, I get to do the fun part today. I get to read the winners of all these awards. You know, 2020 was a heavy year, guys, for news. It was pandemic, it was election, immigration news at the border. And we got so lucky because it produced some amazing journalism. So I want to honor and recognize all of these winners right now. And as Suki and Scott were saying before, we encourage you to use the chat box. If you want to congratulate any of these winners for their amazing work, just shout them out, send them a little message. You can do that in the chat box. And okay, are we ready? We'll start with the first award. We're going to start with Best News Special Report. And the winner is WLIWWNET13, the face of America's great social depression. Diane Maciale, executive producer, Dominic Camilla, senior broadcast producer, Christina Timothy, senior broadcast producer, and Raphael Pi Roman, host. Let's take a look at the award for coronavirus pandemic coverage. The winner is CBS New York frontline nurse, Carolyn Gussoff, reporter, Joe Garufi, editor. The winner for immigration news is documented coverage of unaccompanied immigrant minors in the New York area. Mazin Sidamed, co-executive producer from documentedny.com. The winner for history news, once again, it is Newsday, confronting a crisis, how Long Islanders united to fight an epidemic in 1898. That's John Hans, reporter. For nonprofit news feature story, The winner is Blind Swimmer, Life Changer, Keith Lopez, video journalist for PIX11 News. The winner for breaking news is, ah, it's WCBS News Radio 880, The Fury of Isaias, our whole WCBS News team. Yay to our news team for 880. The winner of the award for health news is patch.com, giving blood in a world of COVID-19. A Long Island man tells his story. And that's Peggy Spellman Hoy, editor. For science news, the winner, again, is CBS New York. Save the honeybees, says Garden City widower, Jennifer McLogan, reporter. Yay to Jennifer. For education, the Sean A. Finelli Award. The award goes to WABC TV. It is student challenges in person student challenges in-person learning guidelines. Kristen Thorne, the reporter, Anthony Saturno, the photographer. For religion, the Monsignor Thomas Hartman Award. For religion news, the winner is patch.com. Good Shepherd Flock moves forward after fire. Peggy Spellman Hoy, editor. For coronavirus pandemic coverage, documented community-driven coronavirus coverage for immigrant New Yorkers. Nicolas Rios, audience editor, and Kevin Dugan, freelance reporter. For public policy news, the award goes to Dan's Papers, Shinnecock's cry for protection of unmarked graves, finally answered. That's Taylor Vesey, reporter. For election coverage, the award goes to WLIW FM, special coverage of election 2020. Diane Masiale, host and general manager, Kyle Lynch, production manager, Delaney Hefner, production and and administration coordinator, Joe Shaw, Express News Group panelist, Beth Young, East End Beacon panelist, David Retray, East End Star panelist, Joe Workmeister, Times Review panelist. I wanted you all to get your shout out there. And the award for weather, boating, and coastal news goes to 
WABC TV, Tropical Storm Isaias, and the power outages that plagued PSEG. Even though that is not matching what I am seeing on the screen there. So let me give a shout out to Dance Papers again. They won the award for arts and cultural news. That's all eyes on Bonic Blind, Art Sparks Vandalism, and Conversation. David Taylor, Associate Editor. All right, let's see what you guys got next. I'll follow you. Arts and Culture feature, The Dig with L. McLogan, Floyd Memorial Library. L. McLogan, digital reporter for CBS New York. And we will do the winner now for weather, boating, and coastal news, tropical storm Isaias, and the power outages that plagued PSEG. Stacy Sager, reporter. Joe Tesaro, photographer. And our next winner for continuing news story, Thomas Murphy, continuing coverage. Cecilia Dowd, Matt Golub, Howard Schnapp, James Carbone, John Rocca, and Greg Insarillo from Newsday. Congratulations to you guys. And the award now for Community Service News, COVID Nursing Staff Moves Into Group Home. Jennifer McLogan, reporter for CBS New York. The award for Feature Story. The winner is WLIW WNET 13, Emmanuel Acho, Uncomfortable Conversations with a Black Man. Diane Masiale, Executive Producer, Local Production. Dominic Camilla, Senior Broadcast Producer. Christina Timothy, Senior Broadcast Producer. Jack Ford, Host. Congratulations again, guys. The winner for feature story, Parachute Wedding Dress. Newsday is the winner, Cecilia Dowd, Howard Schnapp, and Mario Gonzalez. And next is Community Affairs News. The winner, CBS New York, Long Islanders Protests. Carolyn Gussoff, reporter, Joe Garufi, editor. And let's take a look at the winner for Community Affairs News, Har Fizpatch.com for Harlem Council Rep clashes with Community Board over NYPD funding. Nick Garber, reporter. And the award for Health News, WSHU Public Radio. Goes to COVID-19, brings DNA vaccines to the forefront. J.D. Allen, reporter. The award for Continuing News Story goes to CBS New York, the saga of victim Thomas Falva. Jennifer McLogan, reporter, who did some excellent reporting on that story. And the winner for Immigration Feature, WSHU Public Radio, Every Town, The Hamptons, Charles Lane, reporter, and Lopez editor, Max Wasserman, producer. And the award for Best Talk Show, I think this is our last one, goes to Anne Liguri, WFAN, Talking Golf with Anne Liguri. And again, we're encouraging you to just send a little congratulations, use the chat box, say hi, give a message to anyone who is one of our winners today and congratulations to all these winners. And now to focus on, to honor even some more winners, I'm going to turn it over to Derry Alexander from Fox 5 News. Hi, Derry. Hello, hello. Oh my goodness, it's wonderful to see you. Um, I am, let's see, I'm going to just see if I can get this to go. I seem to be having a little bit of technical problems. <laughs> um, so forgive me, everyone, but we're still celebrating and this is still very wonderful. And Linda, I hope you are well and staying safe. I hope you're staying safe too, Derry. We can hear you. So that's like half a good sign. I know. It's it's really be totally good to go. Because nobody needs to see me. They just need to hear about themselves and how wonderful <laughs> they've done today. Okay, so here we go. Let's talk about more winners. The coronavirus pandemic coverage feature, Patch.com, beloved Washington Heights station, agent dies from coronavirus, Anna Quinn. And then we have coronavirus pandemic coverage, continuing coverage of coronavirus, Newsday, Newsday staff. Coronavirus pandemic coverage, WSHU public radio, COVID support groups offer place for those with ongoing symptoms, Desiree Dioriel. Congratulations. Environment feature, CBS New York, Butterfly Mama, Carolyn Gussoff, reporter, and Joe Garufi, editor. Able Newspaper, The Ada, The Fight for Rights, Angela Melody, publisher and editor, Karen Falcone-Krieger, staff writer. 
Let's talk about history news now. CBS New York, crew working to restore Rosalind Griss Mill finds historical artifacts in bottle. Jennifer McLogan, reporter, congratulations. Education, the Sean A. Finelli Award, patch.com. Hundreds voice stories of racism at Queens Private School. Maya Kaufman is the reporter. Religion News, Monsignor Thomas Hartman Award, CBS New York. The history of the Underground Railroad is tied with the AME Zion Church in Manhasset. Jennifer McLogan is the reporter. Congratulations. Coronavirus pandemic coverage, WRHUFM, WRHU.org, Radio Hofstra University, well said, coronavirus and cancer care. Ira Nash, MD, John Mullen, Stephanie Lynn, and Connor Pilkerton. All right, business news now. CBS News, New York. The Long Island print shop churning out thousands of cardboard Mets fans to pack City Field. That's Jennifer McLogan, reporter. Housing feature. Long Island Business News. Housing Crunch, that's David Winzelberg. Congratulations. All right, let's talk about a history feature now. Newsday, soaring success in 1939, Port Washington's place in aviation history took off. That's John Hams. Business feature, Long Island Business News, the year the music died. That's David Winzelberg. All right, feature story now. Patch.com. Beset by coronavirus, NYC man rides a lonely roller coaster. Maya Kaufman is the reporter. Congratulations. Feature story. Newsday. American gangster. Sandra Petty, staff reporter, Robert Cassidy, executive director, multimeter media, Rachel Brightman is the producer. Multimedia, Jeffrey Basinger is the senior editor, Multimedia. Best newscast, CBS, WCBS AM News Radio 880, the morning after the protests, WCBS News Team. All right, it's time for student winners. Continuing news story, opioid addiction on Long Island, a multi-part series, Claire Blaha, Robert Traverso, Angelo Van Sant, Alexandra Whitbeck, and Anne-Marie Lepard, the Long Island Advocate, Hofstra University. Election coverage now, Focus Democracy, Montclair News Lab, Katie Cameron is the senior producer, Michael DiMatteo is the senior producer, Michael Banovich is also a senior producer. Grace Rowland, anchor. Louis Biondolilio is the anchor. This is Montclair State University. Congratulations. Best special news report, charting the 2020 election. Hofstra Entertainment Access Television, WRHU Radio Hofstra University, 88.7 FM, Lawrence Herbert School of Communication, Hofstra University, congratulations. Enterprise Reporting, Manhattan Globe, COVID-19 spurs enrollment drop at New York Tech. Ioannis Ikramidis, Lead Reporter. Nicole Miranda, Editor-in-Chief. Emily Peacock and Gabby Pineda, they are the copy editors, Sedona Young, web editor, Larry Jaffe, advisor, NYIT. Feature story, Pencil and Jess, puppeteering their way through the pandemic. Taylor Rose Clark, editor-in-chief, the Hofstra Chronicle, Hofstra University. All right, let's talk weather, boating, and coastal news. WRHU-FM Radio Hofstra University, 
Hempstead Helps Puerto Rico Relief Effort. Eli Finkelson. Congratulations. History feature, WSHU Public Radio, Slavery on Long Island, the history that we forget to remember. Brian Leda, Wilco Martinez Cachero, Vaidik Travetti, Taylor Biglane, Antonia Brogna, Catherine Hugh, Megan Valley, Isabel de Solaire, Gary Grayrot, Margaret Osborne, Kiara Thomas, and Felicia Lalomia. Congratulations. Community Service, WRHU FM, Radio Hofstra University, Operation Safe, Kids Safe, Natalie Kite. Education feature now. This is the Sean A. Finelli Award. WRHU FM, Radio Hofstra University. Students work in on weekend, compete in Brain Bee. That's Rachel Lusher. Coronavirus pandemic coverage, Black Lives Matter and mental health. Montclair News Lab, Giovanna Boggins is the reporter. Montclair State University, congratulations. Feature story, WRHU FM, Radio Hofstra University, Wedding Venues Rally to Reopen, Lauren Brill and Katerina Belales. Best Newspaper, The Hofstra Chronicle, The Hofstra Chronicle staff, and Hofstra University. Wow, that's so wonderful. So many wonderful winners. I'm so happy for you that you could be acknowledged even though we're in a pandemic. This is so wonderful. Keep up the good work, everybody, and congratulations. I hope that everything goes well and we can be out of this and see each other together sometime soon again. Thank you. And I'm going to toss it back to Linda, I believe. Ah, oh, Dari, great job. I'll take it from here. Suki, you there? Suki? Suki? I'm here. I'm good. Can you? I thought I lost you for a minute, Suki. I only see myself right now. Sorry, Suki and Scott. Hi. Oh, hey, Dari. Good to uh, I'm good so you. Good to see you guys. You look great. <laughs> good to see you, Dari, as me. always. Sorry, I had a technical problem. Ah, uh, okay. yeah, those Hurry green on. screens never work. <laughs> But also, Derry, I mean, long as we could hear you and it was here, it was wonderful to hear your beautiful voice. And we thank you for your participation. Happy, happy to participate. You look beautiful, both of you. Love you both. Uh, love you, Derry. Take care. Thank you, All right. Uh, All Soup, right. that was uh, great to hear the colleges. Montclair State making a big run. Hofstra. Absolutely fantastic. You want to do, uh, want to finish it up? We have a few more to do, you and you and I. Yes, we do. You and I have it. Uh, we'll be announcing the winners in the social media categories. And this portion of the award is open to all news media, businesses, not-for-profits, individuals, anywhere. Social media has no geographical boundaries. And neither do we, Scott. Neither do we. <laughs> <laughs> so social media campaigns that educate, enlighten, and, of course, inspire are all required for entry. All right, you start it off, Sue. Go ahead. Start All right, off. so this year's uh, winners, we're going to start off with the best overall campaign. I'm going to put on my glasses for this one. It's ZECC for a town of Hempstead, raising awareness, or raising America's largest township throughout the pandemic. Uh, David Chavon, Executive Vice President. Samantha Chilemi Brenz, Manager of Operation and Special Events. So Greg Gordon, Director of Public Relations. Rafaela. Tonani, and ZE Creative Communications. All right, Suk, how about we do best use of social media by a news outlet? Uh, we're talking about WLIWFM, WLIWFM studio sessions. Diane Maschiali, general manager, hope I said that right. Michael McKay, Gianna Volpe, Brian Cosgrove, Edge Herman, local hosts, Keith Lynch, production. Delaney Hafner, Production and Administration Coordinator. Corey Holder, Senior Engineer, WLIWFM. Congrats to those guys. Congratulations. And best podcast, Health and Welfare, 
COVID-19 mindful moments for healthcare workers, David North, Andre Doherty, and David North Media, Northwell Health. Congratulations. How about best public awareness campaign? Best public awareness campaign, New York Sea Grant, Beach Safely. Paul C. Focasio, communications manager, New York Sea Grant. Campaign of the year, Mount Sinai South NASA. Behind the mask, Mount Sinai South NASA External Affairs and Development Departments. David Hanshaw, videographer, Spot On Productions. Suki, let's go to best use of social media by a nonprofit. Best use of social media by a nonprofit. Barry and Florence Friedberg, JCC. Hashtag Friedberg Friends, our story. Why do you give? Or why do you give, I should say. Stacy Sweet, Director of Communications and Development, producer, Lisa Goldschmidt, associate producer and editor. Congratulations. And our final award this afternoon, Best Community Service Campaign, ZECC for Girl Scouts of Suffolk County. Girl Scouts of Suffolk County, Smith Point Light Show Campaign. Christine Samaraco, Senior Account Executive. Maria Cosquia Montez, Montanez, Senior <laughs> Manager, Media and Production and Social Media Specialist, and ZE Creative Communications. Congratulations to everyone here. Um, it has been an incredible afternoon at the did Fair they, Media did, Council Foley Awards. Did they keep the segment in for our closing song or no? I don't think so. Are we out of time for that? <laughs> Should we say so long, farewell? Avida <laughs> saying goodbye. But it's not good night. It's good afternoon. And the best part is it, it's Friday. So everybody yes. gets a chance to enjoy the afternoon. And it's going to look like a beautiful weekend. And we all definitely deserve it. Congratulations to everybody for their hard work this year. It has been an incredible year uh, with a lot of uphill climbing. But you know what? People count on the media to do their job. And that's exactly what you did. And we appreciate you here at the Fair Media Council Foley Awards. Yep, and don't forget to find out more about the Foley Awards and the Fair Media Council. It's fairmediacouncil.org. Thank you to everybody joining us today. Suki, all the winners, congratulations to you. You look great in your glasses and yellow and that beautiful living <laughs> area. Thank and you so much, Scott. Jackie Clement, it's, listen, Suki, this isn't easy to put together. It's Jackie does it every year. With all, with all the fanfare and uh to do it this way, I know it's very difficult. And, uh, you know, listen, as long as you get the names of those winners out and uh, everybody pats themselves on the back for a job well done and we keep going, hopefully next year we're in person because- uh, I'm missing that Chateaubriand. And I'm sitting here with no dessert, Suki. So uh, <laughs> that's nice, thank you so much. And uh, Suk, uh, I'll talk to you in five minutes. All right, talk to you soon. <laughs> Bye everybody from Fair Media Take Council. Care. Thank you. Bye.